Wednesday, January 4th, a monster storm is hitting Northern California this evening. There are already reports of downed trees and flooding. If the storm materializes as we anticipate, we could see widespread flooding, mudslides, and power outages in many communities. California Governor Gavin Newsom declares a state of emergency. Much of Europe is experiencing a record-breaking winter heat wave. California Republican Kevin McCarthy comes up short on the fourth, fifth, and sixth ballots to choose a new House Speaker. Even Donald Trump's endorsement of McCarthy isn't persuasive. Even having my favorite president call us and tell us we need to knock this off, I think it actually needs to be reversed. The president needs to tell Kevin McCarthy that, sir, you do not have the votes and it's time to withdraw. And with that, I yield. Thank you. President Biden says he'll make his first presidential visit to the U.S.-Mexico border when he travels to Mexico City next week. And Poland's defense minister signs a deal to buy a second batch of U.S. Abrams battle tanks. From the studios of KPFA in Berkeley, this is the Pacifica Evening News. I'm Eileen Alfandari. The Bay Area is feeling the brunt of a powerful winter storm that will bring flooding, down trees, and likely power outages. After a relatively calm day, the storm hit late this afternoon. Earlier in the day, Governor Gavin Newsom declared a state of emergency to aid in cleanup. State and local officials urged residents to stay off the roads. They said if drivers encounter water, they should turn around and not try to drive through it. The first evacuations were ordered for those living in the burn scar areas of three recent wildfires in Santa Barbara County, where heavy rain is expected overnight and could cause widespread flooding and unleash debris flows in several areas. In early January of 2018, massive torrents carrying huge boulders, mud and debris roared down coastal mountains and through the town of Montecito to the shoreline, killing 23 people and destroying more than 100 homes. Among those killed were two children whose bodies were never found. In Northern California, a 25-mile stretch of Highway 101 was closed between the towns of Trinidad and Oric due to several downed trees. This storm comes days after a New Year's Eve downpour led to the evacuations of people in rural Northern California communities and the rescue of several motorists from flooded roads. One person was found dead in his submerged vehicle. More from Max Pringle. Residents of Northern California were being urged to avoid unnecessary travel starting Wednesday night into Thursday afternoon. We anticipate that this may be one of the most challenging and impactful series of storms to touch down in California in the last five years. That's Nancy Ward, director of the Governor's Office of Emergency Services. She says the emergency declaration allows the state to get help more quickly to people who may need it. If the storm materializes as we anticipate, we could see widespread flooding, mudslides, and power outages in many communities. Evacuation orders have been issued in several Bay Area counties, including the East Bay Hills and parts of Santa Cruz County. Carla Namath is director of the California Department of Water Resources. She says the storm is coming after three years of intense drought, which brings a particular set of risks. What that means is a lot of our trees are stressed after three years of intensive drought. The ground is saturated and there is a significant chance of downed trees that will create significant problems, potentially flooding problems, potentially power problems. North Bay residents are bracing for the possibility of flooding along the Russian River. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association predicts that the river will rise several feet above flood level overnight on Thursday. 
Carla Namath with the Department of Water Resources said Mendocino County residents along the Russian and Navarro rivers should stay on alert. If you live in any of those areas, again, you need to be very attentive to your county uh, emergency operations and heed their warnings. State social services officials say they're partnering with local communities to provide services for the most vulnerable members of the community during the storm like the elderly, the disabled, and the unhoused. Kim Johnson is California Department of Social Services Director. She says emergency shelters will be opening across the state. All are welcome at these shelters and no identifi identification is required. The Department of Social Services is also engaging with the oper operators of the facilities that we license, including child care programs, children's residential programs, and adult and senior care settings, to ensure that all are prepared. San Jose has declared a state of emergency for the duration of the storms, and Mayor Matt Mahon has issued an evacuation order for unhoused people living near the city's creeks and waterways for safety reasons. Mayor Mahon told reporters that the city has expanded shelter capacity to accommodate people needing to get out of the weather. We at the city are uh, continuing to work with our regional and local partners to deploy outreach teams and notify people of the extreme weather conditions and encourage them to move on and find shelter placements of which the city has made a number available. Transportation officials are advising people to stay home. But if people must travel by road, they advise against driving through any standing water where you can't see the bottom, and to drive more slowly in anticipation of road obstructions like fallen trees, power lines, and other debris. Tony Tavares is director of the California Department of Transportation, or Caltrans. He said information about road closures and other information is available through the department's app. If you do have to travel, I will say before you travel, Caltrans has, has several uh, options for you to obtain real-time traffic information and road closure information. We have a mobile app called Quick Map. I urge everyone to download it. It works on any smartphone. It provides you uh, push notifications of any road closures or, or traffic concerns, and it will give you the real-time information. The name of that app, again, is Quick Map. It's available on Android and Apple. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. In the last hour, San Francisco Mayor London Breed urged city residents to stay indoors and off the roads, if at all possible, and to only call 911 for life-and-death emergencies. As the wind gusts pick up anywhere between 50 and 70 miles per hour, we can anticipate that trees will be falling, power outages will occur, floods will happen in this city, and we want to do everything we can to minimize the amount of time that our emergency personnel is spending on life-threatening types of situations. Breed said if people want to report storm drains backing up or other non-life-threatening situations, they should call 311, not 911. Mary Ellen Carroll is director of the San Francisco Department of Emergency Management. She said after a quiet day, the rain was coming down hard and not letting up anytime soon. Carroll also urged people to stay indoors if at all possible and to prepare for the power going out. Uh, if you have to be out and you encounter a flooded area, please do not drive through it. And please, obviously, if there are any downed power lines, you need to uh, avoid those. Um, we want also people to prepare for the likelihood of power outages with all of this wind, with all of this inundation to our underground, and with trees going down, we expect we will have power outages. Um, some simple things you can do to just keep yourself safe and more comfortable is obviously keep a flashlight with extra fla fresh batteries, store uh, water in your freezer if you have it, um, and check on your neighbors, friends, and family who may need assistance. Despite officials urging people to stay inside out of the storm, unhoused people in San Francisco and throughout the Bay Area far outnumbered the shelter beds available. In the North Bay, advocates are calling for more emergency shelter for unhoused residents and for law enforcement to stop evicting people sheltering in parked cars and mobile homes as the state is drenched with intense winter storms. Corinne Smith reports. 
There are an estimated 3,000 unhoused residents in Sonoma County, but only 1,000 shelter beds, according to the county's 2022 point-in-time count. Facing the severe rainstorm this week, the City of Santa Rosa and Catholic Charities opened an emergency warming center downtown at the Caritas Center on A Street. It has capacity for 90 people and is open Wednesday night through Thursday. But there are no cots for sleeping provided there, which is not sufficient, says Gail Simons, a retired nurse and volunteer with Homeless Action. No cots are provided. Warm drinks and snacks are provided And at 7 a.m., no matter what the weather, people have to go out. Simon says that people sheltering under freeways out of the rain are usually evicted by law enforcement, who also cite cars or mobile homes parking longer than 72 hours. And we know that there are a large number of people that are in cars and in RVs that are moving around constantly to avoid police moving them. I think people can stay in one place for 72 hours, but again, if anybody complains, then the police begin to say, you need to move. She says some churches are providing shelter and safe parking. Tent encampments are not allowed in Sonoma County, and there are just two sanctioned parking lots in Sebastopol and Santa Rosa. Because an RV is a person's home, but if they don't have a place to park it, it's a problem. So there's one in Sebastopol that houses uh, 28 people right now has 20 spots, I think, or 23 spots. And then there's one in Santa Rosa run by the city of Santa Rosa. And they may have as many as 60 spots, 40 to 60 spots for RVs within the city limits. And, you know, they provide security and porta potties and trash services in both of those places. In western Sonoma County, the National Weather Service forecasts that the storm will flood out some parts of the Russian River, where it will exceed its banks in Hopland and Guerneville. Simon says for people unsheltered and camping in those areas who are at higher risk of hazardous flooding, there is some shelter and support offered by West County Health Services in Guerneville. There is West County Health Services. There is a shelter out there and It's, again, a smaller group of people, but much more at risk of flooding. So I'm concerned about them. If this rain persists, there's going to be flooding along the rivers and creeks in that area. And um, we will hope that the people that are camping in those places will move to higher ground, you know. Homeless Action Sonoma is operating a warming center in downtown Sonoma, open seven days a week on Napa Street. In Marin County, officials have opened up an emergency warming center located at the Marin County Health and Wellness Campus on Kerner Boulevard in San Rafael. It's first come, first serve, and open from 5 p.m. Wednesday through 6.30 a.m. Thursday. For KPFA News, I'm Corinne Smith. Bomb cyclones, atmospheric rivers, and the role of climate change in it all. Upfront host Brian Edwards Teekert got explanations from Eugene Cordero, professor of meteorology and climate science at San Jose State University. A bomb cyclone is a, uh, a weather system or storm that intensifies very quickly. So it's like a, a, a superstar storm um, because the the low pressure that's in the center of the storm it gets lower and lower and lower over a 24-hour period much more quickly than typical storms so it kind of drops like a bomb and and when that happens uh, the winds get very strong rainfall is is severe um, and it's just a way that meteorologists can classify or describe uh, a super severe intense storm what typically drives that well, you know, these, these mid-latitude cyclones or these storms are, are, are all around the world at all times, um, but they are driven by the, the difference in temperature between the cold um, Arctic and the warmer um, tropics. And the larger that temperature difference is, the, the stronger these storms are. In, in our case, this is interacting with something our audience will be more familiar with in the atmospheric river. Yeah, I'll I'll be honest with you, Brian. You know, we have in the last, I would say, decade or two um, become more descriptive of our weather and climate events. Uh, And, you know, there's a polar vortex, too, that said that, you know, those are are relatively newer terms that we're using to describe events. But the atmospheric river you mentioned um, is 
is associated with these storms where um, plumes of, of very moist air are being drawn up from the subtropics and tropical area into our latitudes, into our region. And so it is like a, a river of water coming through. I think it's a good description of, of um, at times, what happens with these storms. And, and we're, we're seeing that right now. We, we saw that a few days ago on New Year's Eve, and, and then we have these atmospheric rivers now coming into our system, into our part of, the, of California um, over the next few days. So what what we're dealing with, what we're expecting over the next couple of days, where does this fit on like the distribution of normally possible weather patterns in our region? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is we are we're getting a winter storm, which we all want for trying to alleviate this this drought. Um, but what's different here is that it's the timing that so we're getting one storm after another. Um, and, you know, this is the first first surge is happening right now, but then we're going to get another one tomorrow and then maybe Friday. Um, and, and ultimately the timing is, is not ideal because, because of the potential for flood and for damage and for loss of life. Um, and, you know, some people are, are wondering, you know, is this normal? Um, even my dad was asking me, it doesn't seem like this happened before so much. Um, we don't, you know, we, we we don't usually get this amount of, of water coming with this with these storms, and and climate change is playing a role here. Is that with the warmer um, temperature of our planet, um, the atmosphere can hold more water, and we've shown we've seen with data that that storms have become um, more intense and and are delivering more more rainfall. And here's a classic example right now, is that uh, that our warmer atmosphere can hold more water, and we're bringing that water from the subtropics into our region and, and dropping it in California, in our, in our cities and towns. So, um, and, and it's happening one after another. We, we don't know whether the frequency of these types of storms is directly connected to climate change, but we know that we've, we've changed our whole system. It's, it's our whole climate system is different than it was 50 years ago. Um, and and we're, we're seeing the impacts that that is having um, at a very localized level. Eugene Cordero, professor of meteorology and climate science at San Jose State University. This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno. I'm Eileen Alfandari. House Republicans stumbled through a second day of multiple ballots and are headed for a third day tomorrow after adjourning in the last hour. They were unable to elect their leader, Kevin McCarthy, as House Speaker or come up with any other strategy to end the political chaos that has marked the start of their new majority. My colleagues, well, it's Groundhog Day again. Florida Republican Kat Kamek nominated McCarthy on the sixth ballot. The ultimate outcome wasn't much different than the previous five tries. Twenty conservative holdouts still refused to support him, leaving McCarthy significantly short of the 218 votes typically needed to become speaker. In fact, McCarthy saw his tally slip to 201 as one Republican switched to vote simply present. After the sixth ballot, Republicans voted abruptly to adjourn as they deprecated desperately searched for an end game to the chaos. They came back into session at 5 p.m., and then a McCarthy ally made an immediate motion to adjourn until tomorrow. That motion narrowly passed on a vote of 216 to 214. Wisconsin Republican Mike Gallagher, who nominated McCarthy on today's first try, tried to put a positive spin on the Republican Party's embarrassing deadlock. Sure, it looks messy. But democracy is messy. Democracy is messy by by design, by design. And that's a feature. That's a feature, not a bug of our system. We air it all out in the open for the American people to see. Yesterday, the rump group of 20 right-wingers threw their support behind Ohio firebrand Jim Jordan, despite Jordan saying he doesn't want to be speaker. Today, they nominated a willing opponent of McCarthy, Byron Donalds of Florida. He's one of four black Republicans who will serve in the current Congress. Texas Republican Chip Roy, who has been lambasted in the past for making light of lynching and who has called critical race theory racist, nominated Donalds. 
Roy invoked the words of civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. as he did. Now, here we are, and for the first time in history, there have been two black Americans placed into the nomination for Speaker of the House. We do not seek to judge people by the color of their skin, but rather the content of their character. Byron Donalds is a good man raised by a single mom who moved past adversity, became a Christian man at the age of 21, and has devoted his life to advancing the cause for his family and for this country. For their part, Democrats kept offering their leader, Hakeem Jeffries, for speaker, and he kept gaining more votes than McCarthy, but it takes a majority, not a plurality, to be elected speaker. President Biden departing the White House for a bipartisan event in Kentucky with Senate Republican Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said the rest of the world is looking at the scene on the House floor. Biden said, I just think it's really embarrassing. It's taking so long. He added, I have no idea who will prevail. After keeping quiet yesterday, former President Donald Trump early today urged Republicans to vote for McCarthy. Close the deal, take the victory, Trump wrote on his social media site using all capital letters. Do not turn a great triumph into a giant and embarrassing defeat, he wrote. To win support, McCarthy has already agreed to many of the demands of the Freedom Caucus, who've been agitating for rules, changes, and other concessions that give rank-and-file members more influence in the legislative process. Although they won on many of those points, they say they don't trust McCarthy. McCarthy backer Warren Davidson of Ohio said that distrust goes both ways. The root issue is this. They do not trust Kevin McCarthy. What can heal that divide? Right now, there are a lot of colleagues that don't trust 20 or more of my fellow Republicans. And they'll be back at it tomorrow. The House will go back into session at noon Eastern time. Dozens of military veterans hand-delivered letters to top House Republicans calling on them to publicly condemn political violence as the second anniversary of the January 6th attack on the Capitol approaches. Former Metropolitan Police Officer Michael Fanone wrote the letter, which was signed by more than 1,000 military veterans, active duty members, law enforcement officers, and military families. Fanone, who was beaten and tased during the attack on the Capitol, delivered a copy to Marjorie Taylor Greene's congressional office. Veterans also delivered letters to Republicans James Comer of Kentucky, Jim Jordan of Ohio, Steve Scalise of Louisiana, Elise Stefanik of New York, and to Kevin McCarthy. The visit to the Capitol was organized by the group's Common Defense and Courage for America to bring attention to violent rhetoric they say remains a threat to American democracy. They want top Republicans in the House not only to condemn political violence, but to hold accountable those who spread violent and hate-filled messages. President Biden says he intends to make a first visit as president to the U.S.-Mexico border in connection with his meeting next week in Mexico City with the leaders of Mexico and Canada. Biden said he hoped to see what's going on at the border and also planned to make remarks about border security tomorrow. There have been large increases in the number of migrants at the border, even as a U.S. public health law, Title 42, remains in place that allows U.S. authorities to turn away people seeking asylum in the U.S. Republican leaders have criticized Biden for policies they say are ineffective on border security, and they've been pressuring him to make a trip there. Poland's defense minister has signed a deal to buy a second batch of U.S. Abrams battle tanks. The U.S. deputy chief of mission in Poland said the partnership between the two nations has never been more important and that the tank deal is part of President Biden's pledge to provide the strongest and most reliable military capabilities to Poland on an urgent basis. Poland borders Ukraine and has been an arms transshipment point for the flood of U.S. weaponry to Ukraine. 
Poland is also awaiting delivery of U.S. HIMARS artillery systems and has already received Patriot missile batteries. Karen Chamas reports. As Warsaw strengthens its military cooperation with Washington, officials announced that Poland is the first U.S. ally in Europe to be receiving Abrams tanks. Poland's Defense Minister Mariusz Blaszczak signed the $1.4 billion deal at a military base near Warsaw. The agreement foresees the delivery of 116 Abrams tanks starting this year. This adds to another deal made last year for 250 upgraded tanks that will be delivered in 2025-26. to Polish and U.S. officials said the deal strengthened Poland, the region and NATO's eastern flank as the war in Ukraine continues. I'm Karen Chamas. The Russian military's top leadership came under increased scrutiny today as more details emerged of how at least 89 Russian soldiers and possibly as many as 400 were killed in a Ukrainian artillery attack on a single building. The scene last weekend in the Russian-held eastern Ukrainian town of Makivka, where the soldiers were temporarily stationed, appears to have been a recipe for disaster. Hundreds of Russian troops were reportedly clustered in a building close to the front line of the war, well within range of Ukraine's U.S.-supplied weaponry, possibly sitting close to an ammunition depot and perhaps unwittingly helping Ukrainian forces to zero in on them. The Russian military sought to blame the soldiers for their own deaths. General Lieutenant Sergei Sevryokov said in a statement late yesterday that their phone signals allowed Kyiv's forces to determine the coordinates of the location of military personnel and launch a strike. His remarks appeared on Al Jazeera. Currently, a commission is working to investigate the circumstances of the incident, but it is already obvious that the main reason for what happened was the switching on and massive use, contrary to a ban, of mobile phones by personnel that were in the zone of reach of enemy weapons. This factor allowed the enemy to locate and determine the coordinates of the location of military personnel for launching a missile strike. It was the deadliest known single attack on Russian troops since the war began more than 10 months ago. It has stirred anger and renewed criticism inside Russia of the way the broader military campaign is being handled by the defense ministry. Russian President Vladimir Putin sought to change the subject. He took part via video link in a sending off ceremony for a frigate equipped with the Russian Navy's new hypersonic missiles. Here and now I want to thank the specialists in the defense industry complex who created and started mass production of this unique weapon. As I've said already, there's no equivalent in any country in the world. I'm sure that this powerful weapon will allow Russia to protect itself from potential external threats reliably and will help us serve our country's national interests. Putin said the Zircon missiles are capable of flying at nine times the speed of sound and with a range of more than 600 miles. Russia says the missiles cannot be intercepted. Meantime, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan was to speak by phone with the presidents of both Ukraine and Russia. A spokesperson for Turkey's president said he was continuing intense diplomacy. Erdogan has offered in the past to mediate a ceasefire in Ukraine. The Palestinian ambassador at the United Nations announced the United Nations Security Council will hold an emergency meeting tomorrow. It will follow yesterday's provocative visit by Israel's new far-right minister of national security to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. He was flanked by a large contingent of police officers. Under a long-standing agreement, Jews are allowed to visit the site, which is home to ancient biblical temples, but not to pray there. But Palestinians fear Itamar ben Gavir and other far-right Israelis are ready to violate the agreement. Palestinian Ambassador Riyad Mansour said permanent Security Council members China and France and non-permanent members Malta and the United Arab Emirates had backed the call for an emergency UN Security Council meeting. The attack is not only against our holy sites in Al-Aqsa Mosque and in the Haram Sharif. There are because of this environment of extremism that this Israeli extreme government, the extremist in the history of Israel is providing, is leading to additional aggression against our Christian sites, 
Christian graveyards, you've seen by now that there are crosses over, you know, graveyards being trampled upon and attacked by extreme settlers. The attack on a Christian cemetery in occupied East Jerusalem occurred over the New Year holiday and was discovered last night. Security footage showed two people breaking into the cemetery and destroying icons and smashing crosses. The Jordanian representative at the U.N. was one of a throng of representatives from Arab and Islamic nations and members of the non-aligned movement who joined with the Palestinian representative. Jordan's representative called Israeli cabinet minister Ben Gavir's visit to the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound an act of extreme, extremism that threatened to lead to renewed clashes or worse. And there has to be a firm stand by the international community against this because it will happen again. And once it will happen again, a new cycle of violence will ensue. Jordan is the formal custodian of Islamic holy places in Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's justice minister unveiled the new government's long-promised changes for the judicial system that aim to weaken the Israeli Supreme Court. Critics say the plan will undermine Israeli democracy by giving absolute power to the most right-wing governing coalition in the country's history. Justice Minister Yariv Levine presented a series of sweeping changes aimed at curbing the power of the judiciary, including allowing lawmakers to pass laws that the high court has struck down and effectively deemed unconstitutional. Levine laid out a law that would empower the country's 120-seat parliament to override Supreme Court decisions with a simple majority vote of 61. Levine also proposed that politicians play a greater role in the appointment of Supreme Court judges and that ministers appoint their own legal advisors instead of using independent professionals. The planned overhaul has drawn fierce criticism from Israel's attorney general and Israeli opposition parties, although it's unclear whether they will be able to prevent the far-right government from racing ahead. If Levine's proposed override law is passed, Netanyahu's ultra-Orthodox and ultra-nationalist allies has said they hope to scrap Supreme Court rulings outlawing some Israeli outposts on private Palestinian land in the occupied West Bank. They would also seek to allow for the protracted detention of African asylum seekers and make official the exclusion of the ultra-Orthodox from the country's mandatory military service. This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno. This newscast airs each night at 6, half-hour edition on the weekend. You can listen to it archived online at kpfa.org or subscribe to the Pacifica Evening News as a podcast. I'm Eileen Alfandari. The World Health Organization is repeating its call for China to release data about COVID-19 infection rates, hospitalizations, deaths, and viral sequencing. Dr. Mike Ryan is the Emergencies Program Director at the WHO. He says China's recent changes on how it counts COVID-19 deaths are inadequate. There are certainly issues in terms of the criteria for recording and reporting deaths attributable to COVID-19. We believe that definition is too narrow, which requires a respiratory failure in association with COVID-19 to be registered as a COVID-related death. That is a very narrow definition. We know there are difficulties in all countries very often in recording hospital-related uh, admissions and uh, use of ICU facilities. But again, we believe that the, the current numbers being, being published from, from China underrepresent the true impact of the disease in terms of hospital admissions, in terms of uh, ICU admissions, and particularly in terms of deaths. The WHO director, Dr. Tedros Adhemram Ghebreyesus, said that the agency is concerned about the risk to life in China amid an explosive spread of COVID-19 across the country and the lack of outbreak data from the Chinese government. Trent Murray reports. From its headquarters in Geneva, the WHO gave its latest assessment. WHO is concerned about the risk to life in China and has reiterated the importance of vaccination. That's the organization's director general, Dr. Tedros Adnom Ghebreyesus, who used the briefing to call on Beijing to release more information. 
We continue to ask China for more rapid, regular, reliable data on hospitalizations and deaths, as well as more comprehensive real-time viral sequencing. He also offered cover for more than a dozen countries, including Canada, the United States and Japan, who have decided to introduce pre-departure tests for passengers arriving from China. With circulation in China so high and comprehensive data not forthcoming, it's understandable that some countries are taking steps they believe will protect their own citizens. In Europe, countries remain divided on whether to introduce similar tests. Some, like France, Italy and Spain, have decided to go it alone and introduce their own screening measures, while others, like Germany, have said they don't believe it's necessary. Trent Murray, Berlin. China has slammed the travel restrictions from other nations and has pushed back against the request that it be more transparent about its COVID-19 infection rates, hospitalizations and viral sequencing. Simon Marks reports. The Chinese Foreign Ministry said the entry restrictions unveiled by the US, Japan and others are excessive and unacceptable. But international governments say they're simply listening to the advice of their public health experts. My family are in China and basically every single Chinese person I know either has had COVID has COVID now or knows numerous people who have COVID. So it is really sweeping across the country right now. Cindy Yu hosts the podcast Chinese Whispers and wonders why Beijing so rapidly dropped its zero COVID policy. There are some theories flying around that uh, Omicron was just getting to such a stage by November that they couldn't uh, continue with zero COVID. Obviously, the protests came just before the opening up. So there was this idea that, you know, you've got to give the people something because this is not sustainable. There's also this question of the National Party Congress, which happened in October. So perhaps they were always planning on opening up after that politically sensitive event is over. And another theory is that the government wants the, the country to reach immunity as soon as it can to minimise the disruption economically. The official line from China is that the country has adapted its policy to protect the life and health of people to the greatest extent possible. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has said he's ready to move toward normalizing relations with the United States. He also urged the U.S. to stop engaging in what he called foreign policy blackmail. Maduro made the comments during an interview. With the United States, they are unfortunately trapped in a policy on Venezuela that makes no sense. In supporting institutions that don't exist, an interim president of an assembly of Narnia, which they keep on supporting. In one way or another, the foreign policy blackmail from Florida from Miami holds ground in the White House and the Department of State. It's unfortunate. Venezuela is completely prepared to take a step towards the normalization and regularization of diplomatic consul and political relations with the United States and subsequent governments. Maduro's remarks came just days after opposition lawmakers in Venezuela vowed to terminate the interim government led by the U.S.-backed opposition leader Juan Guaido, who declared himself to be interim president of Venezuela three years ago. Police in Somalia say two suicide car bombers killed at least 10 people early today when they targeted a military facility in a region at the heart of the government's offensive against all Shabaab extremists. One resident said he rescued several people wounded in the attack, including soldiers and journalists who were embedded with the soldiers. Al Shabaab claimed responsibility for the attack. The Al Qaeda linked group of thousands of fighters has controlled parts of central and southern Somalia for years. Iran summoned the French ambassador to condemn the publication of offensive caricatures of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei in the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. The magazine has a long history of publishing vulgar cartoons, which critics say are deeply insulting to Muslims. Two French-born al-Qaeda extremists attacked the newspaper's office in 2015, killing 12 cartoonists, and it has been the target of other attacks over the years. Its latest issue features the winners of a recent cartoon contest in which entrants were asked to draw the most offensive caricatures of Ayatollah Khamenei, who has held Iran's highest office since 1989. The contest was billed as a show of support for anti-government protests rocking Iran. 
The French government, while defending free speech, has rebuked the privately owned magazine in the past for fanning tensions. The Food and Drug Administration has finalized a rule change that allows women seeking abortion pills to get them through the mail, replacing a long-standing requirement that they pick up the medicine in person. Caroline Malone reports. Retail pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens will be allowed to sell abortion pills for the first time as the FDA has changed its regulation on them. Patients still need a prescription from a health care provider, but they can get the pills from the stores or by mail. Previously, the pill, Mifepristone, could only be dispensed by clinics, doctors or specialist pharmacies. The move comes as the Biden administration supports widening abortion access following last year's decision by the Supreme Court to withdraw the constitutional right to it. And that's Caroline Malone. California officials are looking for survivors of government forced or coerced sterilization. The state has four and a half million dollars in reparations to divide up among survivors and finding them has been challenging. Some people were victimized during the eugenics movement that peaked during the 1930s. Others were sterilized while in California state prisons a decade ago. So far, state officials have awarded payments to 51 people out of 310 applications. State officials plan to air TV and radio ads this month in an attempt to find more survivors of forced sterilization. The compensation program will shut down after this year. San Francisco-based business software maker Salesforce is laying off about 8,000 people or about 10 percent of its workforce as major technology companies continue to cut payrolls that they rapidly expanded during a two-year boom spurred by pandemic lockdowns. The cuts announced today are by far the largest in the 23-year history of the company founded by former Oracle executive Mark Benioff. Benioff pioneered the method of leasing software services to Internet-connected devices, a concept now known as cloud computing. Salesforce workers who lose their jobs will receive nearly five months of pay, health insurance, career resources, and other benefits, according to the company. Benioff told employees in a letter that he blamed himself for the layoffs after continuing to hire aggressively into the pandemic. With millions of people working from home and demand for the company's technology surging, he says Salesforce hired too many people. Salesforce employed about 49,000 people in January of 2020, just before the pandemic. The workforce today is still 50 percent larger than it was before the pandemic. This is the Pacifica Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFCF Fresno. I'm Eileen Alfandari. This is Brian Edwards Teekert from Upfront. When we're running down a story or an idea or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast, we take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA. While Northern California is contending with a massive winter storm and more on the way, much of Europe is experiencing a record-breaking winter heat wave. At least 11 countries, including Bosnia, Belgium, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, have topped record-breaking heat this winter since New Year's Eve. Spring-like temperatures have left little or no snow on the mountains of Bosnia and have nearly shuttered ski resorts. The United Nations World Meteorological Organization has long warned about the effects of climate change and says the last eight years have been the eight hottest on record. The fallout this winter has been limited to snowless slopes. Flora and fauna are feeling the impact, too. Some animal migrations have stopped. For the Swiss Ornithological Institute said many ducks that would normally migrate to Switzerland this time of year from Nordic countries don't come anymore. 
Provisional figures released by Great Britain's weather office showed that 2022 will have been that country's warmest year on record. Julia Chapman reports. The Met Office says every month this year, apart from December, was warmer than average. The organization's experts say this is in line with expectations for human-induced climate change. This summer, the UK experienced temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius for the first time ever. During that period, the Met Office issued its first ever red warning for extreme heat. All four seasons of 2022 were in the top 10 warmest on record. And despite a reputation for rainy weather, rainfall in the UK was below average from March onwards. The Met Office says 2022 was also notable for a high number of sunny hours in the UK. Julia Chapman, London. The Environmental Protection Agency is preparing to hold virtual hearings on new proposed rules to control methane pollution, which is a byproduct of oil and gas production. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas pollutant contributing to global warming. Climate justice and public health groups have long urged the EPA to set strict standards. Ross Brown reports. The Environmental Protection Agency's Supplemental Waste Prevention Rule released last month was praised by conservation groups who nonetheless argue it must be strengthened. Attorney Melissa Hornbean with the Western Environmental Law Center says the proposal is a step in improving a draft rule issued by the EPA last year. She wants to see language in the rules tightened to reduce any kind of broad interpretation. They've recognized they have authority over these issues and taking the next step further to actually implement some very specific measures primarily targeted at reducing venting and flaring. The hearings are scheduled Tuesday through Thursday, January 10th through 12th, with more information online at epa.gov. Each year, the U.S. oil and gas sector emits 16 million metric tons of methane into the atmosphere, according to the Sierra Club, which disproportionately affects vulnerable and frontline communities. At his Four Corners ranch in New Mexico, Don Schreiber is surrounded by 122 oil and gas wells on adjacent public lands. He's been advocating for stricter venting and flaring rules for decades. He says the extraction industry shouldn't be allowed to continue self-reporting on its methane waste, which he describes as the fox guarding the hen house because the true value of royalties owed to the state remain unknown. As kind of a veteran of this whole waste control, federal regulation matter. This really is moving in the right direction. It falls short. It needs to be strengthened, but we're moving in the right direction. A new mineral mapping instrument aboard the International Space Station released images in October of a previously unknown large methane lake from a gas well along the Pecos River, 10 miles southeast of Carlsbad. NASA said its EMIT ground scanning instrument is an updated version of one that has mapped the highly potent greenhouse gas across the Permian Basin in the past. This is Roz Brown, New Mexico News Connection. Environmental groups are pointing to a recent 14,000-barrel oil spill in Kansas by the Keystone Pipeline as a warning that a planned pipeline project in Michigan could bring about the same result. Environmental justice activists are calling for tighter regulation of the N-Bridge Line 5 pipeline project or disapproval of it altogether. Mark Richardson has that story. An environmental watchdog group says the recent Keystone Pipeline oil spill should serve as a warning to Michiganders if a proposed expansion of the Enbridge Line 5 project is approved. In early December, Keystone broke open and dumped 14,000 barrels of heavy tar sands oil into a creek on the Kansas-Nebraska border, causing major environmental damage. Sean McBrerty with the group Oil and Water Don't Mix says a break in Line 5, which runs under the Mackinac Straits, could cause as much or more damage as the Keystone spill. What the Keystone spill in Kansas goes to show, even new pipelines spill. There's no foolproof way to build these. There is no way to respond to a major oil spill effectively, especially in a place like the Straits of Mackinac. Line 5 is a 30-inch wide, 645-mile-long pipeline that carries crude oil products from central Ontario through Michigan. And Bridge wants to move the pipeline to a planned tunnel under Lakes Michigan and Huron. 
The company claims the project will protect the straits from an oil spill and create jobs. McBrearty disagrees. He says studies show the proposed project is extremely risky and that rerouting the pipeline has the potential to create an environmental disaster. University of Michigan has detailed the Straits of Mackinac is essentially the worst place in the Great Lakes for an oil spill. And yet, not only are we having this existing pipeline running through there, we're talking about building another pipeline in a tunnel right underneath it. Enbridge is awaiting an environmental impact statement from the Army Corps of Engineers and a decision from the Michigan Public Service Commission, which could take another two years but McBrearty believes it's only a matter of time before Line 5 will fail. They've not been in compliance with their easement with the state of Michigan since 1968. Every day we're thankful that that thing isn't rupturing, but every day it operates is another risk that we really can't afford to take with so much of the world's fresh water at stake in the Great Lakes. For Michigan News Connection, I'm Mark Richardson. The Buffalo Bill said in a statement that 24-year-old Damar Hamlin remains in the ICU in critical condition, with signs of improvement noted yesterday and overnight. Hamlin suffered cardiac arrest and collapsed on the field Monday night during a game. Health officials are using that incident to underline the importance of CPR training. They say speedy administration of CPR can save lives. Mike Moan reports. Life-saving measures are getting a lot of attention this week after an NFL player went into cardiac arrest during a game, and Minnesotans are being reminded about the importance of CPR training. Medical staff applied CPR and a defibrillator shock to Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin after he collapsed on the field. Cardiologist Dr. Robin Germany hopes the broader public is inspired to take on CPR training, noting these medical emergencies can happen at any time in any location. For every minute that adequate CPR isn't given, we're going to lose 10% of patients. And getting CPR to a patient very quickly is very, very important. That statistic is for cardiac emergencies in out-of-hospital settings. Germany, also a board member of the American Heart Association in Minnesota, says bystanders should know the important steps. They include calling 911, beginning CPR, and then using an AED device if available and necessary. On its website, the Heart Association has a search tool to find local CPR training opportunities. And Germany says depending on the situation, a person in cardiac arrest will need a defibrillator to put their heart back into rhythm once CPR is applied. She encourages building owners and operators to have them on hand and for people to notice them when walking through a public setting. Germany notes these devices are user-friendly. The nice thing about the AEDs today is all you have to do is put the patches on. There's really nice instructions. They'll even talk to you. And they'll tell you if that patient needs that electrical shock. You don't have to know anything. The Heart Association says the rate of bystander CPR in North America is estimated at only around 40 percent, and only about 1 in 10 people survive an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So having more bystanders who know CPR can boost survival numbers. Mike Moen, Minnesota News Connection. On January 1st, Alabama became the latest state to allow people to carry a concealed handgun without getting a state permit that requires a background check. The new state law ends the requirement for a person to get a permit to legally carry a concealed handgun in public. The National Rifle Association's lobbying arm advocated for the Alabama legislation. At least half of U.S. states allow people to carry concealed weapons without a permit. Hate groups have become more active on the Internet, spreading bigotry and recruiting young people online. Parents and guardians frequently have no idea what their kids are doing. A Portland, Oregon-based group has published a resource guide for parents, caregivers, and others to help them interrupt the flow of bigoted ideas and conspiracy theories. Eric Tegatoff reports. It can be challenging for parents and caregivers to shield their children from bigotry and hatred online. But there are a few tips they can follow. Lindsay Schubiner with the organization Western State Center says this work is especially crucial because white nationalist groups are using the Internet to recruit people. She says young people are developing identities and ideas in relationship to everything around them, including what they see and hear online. As hate violence and threats to democracy continue and bigotry and conspiracy theories are further mainstreamed, young people see that and it has an impact. So it's really important for parents and caregivers to provide an open space to critically examine what all of that means to them and to their future and to their values. 
About 45% of middle and high school students said they have been the victim of cyberbullying, according to a survey from the Cyberbullying Research Center. The survey also shows cyberbullying has been increasing over the past decade. Schubiner says vigilance is the first key to ensuring kids are staying safe online. She says, for example, hate groups use jokes minimizing violence, scapegoating, or straw man arguments to manipulate people online. Tactics, she says, both kids and parents need to be aware of. Helping them to recognize the kinds of strategies that are intended to influence them can be a really powerful way to push back against this. Schubiner encourages parents and caregivers to listen openly and non-judgmentally to their kids about their online experiences. She notes that cutting off access to friends or the internet can backfire because many white nationalists manipulate followers into seeing this as evidence of political correctness and attempts to curb free speech. Schubiner says a better approach is to enlist people your kid trusts. Really lean on relationships and relationships that the young person has with either older peers or other adults who share inclusive and equitable values. For Washington News Service, I'm Eric Tegedoff. And recapping the evening's top story, the winter storm, the Bay Area is feeling its brunt with high winds and rain that will bring flooding down trees and likely power outages. After a relatively calm day, the storm hit late this afternoon. Earlier in the day, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency to aid in the cleanup. The uh, state and state and local officials urged residents to stay off the roads. They said if drivers encounter water, they should turn around and not to drive through it. The National Weather Service issued a statement saying that the impacts of the storm will include widespread flooding, roads washing out, hillsides collapsing, trees down, potentially full groves, widespread power outages, immediate disruption to commerce, and the worst of all, likely loss of human life. The Weather Service said this is truly a brutal system that we are looking at and needs to be taken seriously. The governor's emergency proclamation supports emergency relief efforts, including authorizing the mobilization of the California National Guard to support disaster response, directing Caltrans to request immediate assistance through the Federal Highway Administration's Emergency Relief Program to support highway repairs and other support for local response and recovery efforts. Right before we went to air, San Francisco Mayor London Breed urged city residents to stay indoors and off the roads if at all possible and to only call 911 for life or death emergencies. Breed said if people wanted to report storm drains, backing up, or other non-life-threatening situations, they should call 311 and not 911. The director of the city's Department of Emergency Management also urged people stay in, to stay inside if at all possible and to prepare for the power going out. And the North Bay residents are bracing for the possibility of flooding along the Russian River. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association predicts that the river will rise several feet above flood level overnight on Thursday. The Department of Water Resources head said that Mendocino residents along the Russian and Navarro rivers should also stay on alert. And the weather forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area. A flood watch is in effect until tomorrow afternoon. A high wind warning until tomorrow at 10 a.m. With a prediction of winds gusting to 45 miles per hour or higher, there's a chance of a thunderstorm along with the rain tonight into tomorrow. The skies are expected to clear on Friday before another storm arrives on Saturday. In Fresno in the central San Joaquin Valley, a flood watch is in effect until Friday morning, a wind advisory until tomorrow morning with wind gusts up to 30 miles per hour. Rain tonight and tomorrow with thunderstorms likely tomorrow. Skies are expected to clear on Friday. Thanks for joining us on the Pacifica Evening News. Peter Stickney produced recorded portions and is at the controls. I'm Eileen Alfandari. KPFA is now live streaming news headlines online. 
Just in case you can't listen to the radio, tune into our Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube for news headlines. That's at KPFA 94.1 on Facebook and at KPFA Radio on Twitter and YouTube. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF, 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org. Mm-hmm.